from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 20, recorded Monday, June 5th, 2006. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Codesmith Tools, makers of Codesmith, an extensible template-based code generator for .NET. And now Hansel Minutes listeners get $100 off Codesmith Professional with coupon code HM100 online at codesmithtools.com. Support is also provided by ExceedZip for .NET, which lets you handle zip, tar, and gzip files on FTP servers, in streams, in memory, and more. Now get 20% off any Exceed component or suite just for listening to Hansel Minutes. Just go to shrinkster.com slash FPT and use the code HM-20-20. And don't forget to visit peterbloom.com. Start with better controls, finish with better sites. Online at P-E-T-E-R-B-L-U-M dot com. And dot .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading dot .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott discusses Microsoft Office 2007. Hi, this is Carl Franklin, and you're listening once again to Hansel Minutes. I'm here with Scott Hanselman, of course, and uh, this week we're talking about Office uh, Office 12, Office 2007, right, Scott? Absolutely. Everything you need to know on the way to work about Office 2007. So, where do we start? I mean, this is such a huge thing. There's a lot of topics to cover and some news newsworthy issues. Where do you want to start here? Well, let's start with the UI. I posted a thing recently about the UI that I uh, called Everything You Know is Different. Yeah. Uh, Office is very different. It's freakishly different. It's yeah. totally different. Um, it's it's completely redesigned, reinvented, reskinned realization. The the whole toolbar menu kind of thing that you're used to, the whole right click on the toolbar uh, is kind of gone. Yeah, I, I would say that you could sum it up by saying, "Hey, where did my menus go?" Yeah, everything is different. There's a new thing that they're calling the ribbon. Yeah, and the ribbon is that area at the top of the window. That's got everything that you would need to use to talk to the uh, machine, talk to the system. Just on another note, IE7 sort of lost the the traditional menus too. They don't have a ribbon, but uh, you, you know, they're they're clearly Microsoft is is got some ideas with accessibility. Yeah, after ten years of uh, of menus and uh, toolbars, everything is getting shaken up. So Vista will look different, IE7 will look different, and Office will look different. So what do you make of this? I think it's I think it's a good thing. I think that uh, I would like to see even more dramatic changes myself. I think that the windowing metaphor is uh, seeing it's kind of the end of its days, but there's just not much more that one can do other than point and click at pictures as humans were kind of limited, I think. But uh, on the ribbon, the thing about the ribbon is that you, you'll look at it and it's not quite a menu. It's not quite a toolbar. It's really a series of tabs. It's like a modeless tab dialogue where there are a series of menus at the top, home, insert, page layout, references, review, view. These are all uh, kind of menus, but when you click on one of them, they act more like tabs, Yeah, bringing up a very complicated stacked toolbar. And the thing about the toolbar is these toolbar ribbon pieces that come up um, are va- of varying sizes. This isn't just tabbed toolbars. Uh, each of the buttons on the toolbar will be sized according to how often you would need to use it. So, for example, mm. the paste button on the home toolbar is very large. It's a huge 96 by 96 big icon. It's impossible to miss. Styles are much larger. The find button is huge, while things like strikeout uh, and highlighting are much smaller buttons. So they're really taking um, user interface design and taking user interface um, metrics, actually sitting down with regular people and seeing what they're looking for and applying it directly to the UI. Um, before, every piece of functionality in Word was a peer. Everything, right. you know, the, the, the bold button and the italics button were the same. Here, they're really applying that knowledge about how the users work. Is this knowledge dynamic? Does it change as the user 
uses, say, a particular feature, does that button get bigger? So I have not seen that to be the case. I do not believe that to be the case. I believe that this is is not like the time when they introduced the chevrons, the little pieces of menus, the dynamic moving menus. I think it was decided that folks didn't like things moving out from underneath them. Right. The... uh, if I understand correctly from, from talking to the office team uh, and meeting folks on campus, the the thought was that 80 to 90 percent of the features that are requested in office are already there. They just can't be found. Yeah. So rather than adding a whole bunch of fantastic new features, even though there's lots of new features, they've really brought the ones that were really amazing and powerful up front. Uh, my mom is working on her master's degree, and uh, I, I showed her for the very first time how to create a table of contents, taking a you know fifty page thesis document and turning it into a a really indexed dynamic document with references, footnotes, and a table of contents. She'd been maintaining the table of contents manually. Huh. Uh, this is a feature that's been around since Office ninety five, but it's right. just it's buried. It's hard to find. Uh, in the new office, it's not. I would say. There's been a lot of buried features in office, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Doing reviewing, like um, adding comments and doing track changes, has always been kind of buried. Right. The little tiny track changes button. Another yep. example would be the tiny, 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 and most clicked on button in PowerPoint, which is the little tiny start slideshow button. Right. Down on the very <laughs> lower left corner, you watch yeah. people try to struggle to hit that tiny 8x8 eight eight button. Uh, that's a big giant thing on the slide bar. Uh, ribbon uh, tab now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also an interesting new thing, and this is actually, of all the changes, I think this is the least righteous change. The, the ribbon bar is weird, but once you get it, you'll get it. And you'll go, well, wow, that thing I, I wanted, it's right there. It's almost like it's it's thoughtful. It's, they've actually put thought into it. But mm. the thing that is not very cool is a new thing called the Microsoft Office button, oh. which is a big, fat kind of logo of the Microsoft Office system, big 32 by 32 icon in the upper left corner, and you click on it, and that has got, that's your file menu. That's your open, start, publish, print. That's your button that you click if you want to do something. Right. So if you want to do something with your document, you click the Office button. Problem is, I keep double-clicking on this button trying to close the application that I'm currently on, and all it does is show the menu and make it go away. Hmm. So it, the the whole double click in the upper left corner is gone, and you've got at least in beta two, and you've got this strange office button. Of it's almost like a start button yeah. for office, but everything is so intuitive and makes so much sense, and the ribbon bar really uh, feels right. And then there's this weird logo in the upper corner that you have to click on to do something as simple as file and file open. Huh. But next to that is a new thing called the QAT or the Quick Access Toolbar. And this is the um, the quick launch, you know, using Explorer terms. This is the quick launch bar for Office, which I think is a little odd if you think about it, because we just made that analogy between uh, that parallel rather between the Office button and the Start menu. Right and now we've got the Quick Access toolbar and the Quick Launch. So basically, in your lower left hand corner in in Windows, you've got your Start button and your Quick Launch. In the upper left hand corner, you got your Office button and your Quick Access toolbar. They're just kind of mirror images of each other. This is where you put your save button or any button you use all the time. This is where you put buttons that you want to push no matter what the context is of the document that you're working on. You know, what seems ironic to me is that all these uh, software packages that have quick launch buttons that go in the system tray, you know, to make it easier to, and f- you know, faster to get the application up and running. Well, everybody has these now and they clog your system so much with CPU usage and and memory and all that stuff that there's nothing quick about it. I mean, you got 10 of these things loaded up. You know what I mean? The, the whole system slows down. <laughs> I am referring not to the tray in the lower right-hand corner. I know, but you'd mentioned quick launch uh, oh, I see button, and I'm, I was responding to that. Okay. the This is the kind of the place that you put a bunch of stuff uh, this is the cu- the most customizable place in the in the system. Yeah. Right now, the things you'll find up there are undo, redo, print, and save. But uh, you can right click on any feature on any feature anywhere in Office and say, "Ooh, I like that. I want to bring that up to the top." Now that's cool. Yeah, that is kind of cool. And interestingly, that actually is not a toolbar. It lives in the title bar. So they're making a lot better use of their vertical space. And your title bar says the document name and the fact you're running Microsoft Word. They'll put information in that title bar. So the ribbon actually takes up a little bit less space 
than uh, than in previous versions of Office, which gives you more room for your documents, which is pretty cool. Cool. Now, there's a really interesting document that you can um, download that explains this new UI. It's called Welcome to the New UI at shrinkster.com slash F-O-L. And this is on a blog uh, by a person named Jensen Harris. And this is a user interface blog specifically for Office. So this is a, a user interface designer's uh, who worked on the Office team, or is, is working on the Office team, and all things Office user interface related. Why we did this, what we were thinking, what kind of user interface analysis and usability analysis we did. Cool. And Jensen Harris's blog is at shrinkster slash FON. And I, I really have to tell you that there's a lot more openness this time around uh, with the blogging. Everybody who's involved in an Office product has got a blog. Developers are up there, PMs. Uh, there's an access blog at shrinkster slash FOQ. There's an Excel-specific blog at slash FOR. Um, all of these things just add up to better feedback loop. Hmm. Because I know when they designed Office 2003, I didn't go through any usability testing, right? right? Did, you? Did you? I didn't go anywhere and nope. get filmed. Uh, since they can't fly me up to ask me about uh, where I want a button, I can sure talk to them on their blog. And they really do answer, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, we, we had talked before about we'd had a back and forth with the um, the Outlook team and the RSS, where with the fact that they're putting RSS directly into Outlook and some of the issues I had right. with that. Right. Blogging totally made that made that possible. I, I was definitely feeling that. Hey, Scott, um, does Office look any different with the Arrow interface of uh, Vista? And I guess we're at beta 2 now of Windows Vista than on, say, Windows XP. So I put Windows Vista on my tablet PC, my, two, my Toshiba M205, mm-hmm. and it comes out in kind of a slate gray with, a, uh, with the upper t- part of the toolbar being transparent, and then it's bright blue on my Windows XP machine with no transparency. Um, it doesn't look dramatically different. I mean, I think that, I think that arrow and glass is, is shiny and wonderful, but, mm-hmm. uh, it, eh, you know, so, yeah. gee whiz. Not really that thrilled about it. There aren't any other features in the Vista implementation. No, they they definitely have they have feature feature parity in that in that respect. That's cool. And I had to hack my tablet PC to get Glass anyway. Apparently, you need more than sixty four megs of video RAM now. You need one hundred and twenty eight megs of video RAM in order wow. to get Glass. So there's going to be a haves and the have nots. And uh, the M two hundred five, while it was touted as Longhorn ready when I bought it, apparently uh, not so much. So a little uh-huh. bummed about that. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of great links about Vista and Office at shrinkster.com slash FOM by a guy named Michael Swanson, who's collected a bunch of those links and done done my job for me, which is pretty cool. Great. Now, have you written any Office extensibility stuff? Have you written, you've written macros and stuff? Have you written add-ins? Yeah, I've like written that? macros, but that's about yeah. the extent of it. So the new UI is, is as extensible, if not more so, as the old one, particularly the ribbon extensibility allows you to create all sorts of new gadgets and things. Unfortunately, we're mm. still... Uh, we can still do it in VBA. You can you can write things using the Microsoft Visual Studio for Office uh, pieces, but uh, right. VBA is still the way to do things. And there's a really neat article uh, on ribbon extensibility at Shrinkster uh, slash FOT. Um, and there's a whole new concept of trust. They're really paranoid about security. So rather than just loading up a document and saying, hey, it's got macros, that cool with you? And, you know, hitting a button. Right. There's a notion of trusted locations, which I think is pretty cool. You actually list uh, in the interface a list of folders that you believe are trusted, like it could be a network folder or a folder on your desktop called trusted, huh. uh, or maybe your My Documents folder. And if you trust those places, then you could downloading some, lo- download something from the internet and it wouldn't be trusted. But if you copied it directly into your trusted folder or your My Documents folder, then it would be trusted and you don't have to worry about all that macro nonsense. It's a real nice trade-off between usability and security. Do you see any security holes in that? I mean, what about a, a script that copies to that folder and executes? Those kind of scripts have to be allowed, though. So, yeah, it's totally possible that someone could potentially find a trusted folder and copy themselves there, but you'd have to have okayed the copy. Right, okay. So, as with all things, at some point you have to say, yeah, I think this is cool. So, right. there's always a way they could fool you into, into pushing a button like that, but... Uh, I don't think that someone would want to trust their temporary internet files folder. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good point. Sure. Now, there's a, a, a lot of training uh, going to be available in 2007 because I tell you, if you're taking a 2003 class now, everything you know is wrong. Right. Uh, but uh, up at shrinkster.com slash FOU, there's some really nice beta videos explaining how they're going to do the training. Uh-huh. And I think I, I think I talked about this 
I can't remember if I was talking to you on the last show, but it was really neat. I tried to do um, an existing uh, shortcut key. You know, you go like Alt T for tools, O mm-hmm. for options. Mm-hmm. So I just did it kind of unconsciously. I just went Alt T O. And as I did that, what's called a super tip, not a tool tip, but a super tip. These are really giant tool tips with like paragraphs of information. Wow. Pop popped up and said, Office 2003 compatibility mode, please continue your Office 2003 hotkey. Whoa. So even though the menus are gone, it understands that Alt-T used to bring up the tools menu. You know, I'm really glad they did this because my concern when I first heard about the ribbon was, you know, all the moms and dads out there who have their keystrokes memorized and, and uh, you know, what's going to happen to that? And it was unclear at that time. So that, I'm yeah. glad they did that. And, and interestingly, they've taken that to the next level with uh, another another thing. They have... Uh, if you just push Alt, like for example, I had pushed the Microsoft Office button and I got the big file menu thing. Yeah. And I, I just bumped the Alt button. And interestingly, they put a little tiny picture of a keyboard key, a little key on top of each of the different visual elements huh. with like an F over file and oh, O nice. for open, S for... So just by tapping it, it'll actually cover the screen in little tiny... Uh, keyboard keys telling wow. you, oh, you could push this if you wanted it. So not only does it support your old keystrokes, but it actually promotes the use of new keystroke usage, which is something that's really difficult. A lot of people waste a lot of time putting miles on their mouse when they really could be uh, speeding that up with a with a hotkey. That might be a really good use of opacity of, you know, somewhat transparent I wonder if they're somewhat transparent in Vista. Have you seen that? So speaking of, of really good uses of transparency, if um, if you select a chunk of text, a paragraph or a couple of words, a, a little tiny transparent toolbar will pop up, kind of fade in from nowhere huh. and just appear. And it appears right where your cursor is. Wow. Because you don't have you don't, you don't want to have this select text, scroll up, not scroll up rather. You don't want to have this select text, go to the toolbar, come back. You actually want context sensitive. Right. But instead of instead of selecting and right clicking, it's fair to assume that if someone has just selected text, they probably want to do something with it. Why not give them a tiny transparent toolbar with the most commonly used things, fonts, font size, italics, and things like that. Again, with, with hotkeys for all, uh, promoting things like control B and control I. Wow, that's so awesome. So from a usability standpoint, Word and Excel particularly stand out with just some really amazing leaps in in uh, in usability. Sweet. That sounds great. Now, all the all the the Microsoft is great, Office is awesome kind of um Microsoft apologist stuff aside, I have had some hellish install experiences with the beta software. Oh my god. I'm going to have to ghost my mocks at, at work back to uh, a known state mm-hmm. because Office, I mean, Outlook rather, on my Outlook 12 or Outlook 2007 on my machine at work is just, it's uh, it's carnage. It's absolute carnage. <laughs> um, first, I got into a situation where every time I opened Outlook, I got the little MSI thing popping up telling me I needed to install Visual Studio 2005. Nice. And I didn't have the disk. <laughs> then I got into a thing where every add-in was crashing. So it would be launch Outlook, this add-in crashed, shut down. Launch Outlook, this add-in crashed. So all of my add-ins. So then I went in the registry and just deleted all my add-ins. So Outlook will run for 15 minutes, and then I'll just sit there, and it'll just crash. Poof. That's what you get for running beta software, man. It does. And this is why I ghosted my machine ahead of time. So right. I would encourage people to try this. I mean, don't wait. This is awesome stuff from a usability standpoint. But yeah. it's beta. It's not RC1. It's beta 2. Right. It will probably just rip the guts out of uh, of your system. And if you're working on your degree or you have an assignment due tomorrow, <laughs> uh, tonight would not be the time to install a copy of Office. Uh, but yeah, I'm in, I'm in a hellish, hellish place right wow. now. So I'm just going to bring that back. Now, on the other hand, at home, on my home machine, it's cool in the gang. Yeah. It's happy. It's loving. It's wonderful. Outlook is another thing. Words once one thing, but Outlook, man, the new stuff in Outlook, you're going to love it or you're going to hate it. I love you it. love it? Yeah, I love it. Categorization, yep. flags, search folders are more obvious. And the new to-do bar on the right-hand side there showing you kind of like your life at a glance. It's almost like a mini dashboard. Outlook is the center of my universe. Really? Yeah, it really is. And, and you know, for all of the... All of the issues, you know, little little annoyances that I have, even with uh, the older versions of Outlook, it's still, you know, the inbox is the sort of the center of my universe. 
Yeah. The, the, the add in thing is the only thing that's really frustrating me, but I actually got an email from the PM on the add in team and they're doing their best to work on compatibility. But, uh, you know, it's funny. I kind of feel like a bit of a schmuck when I have things like 15 add ins running in Explorer or five, six add ins running in Outlook and I, th- and I complain, you know, gosh, why doesn't Outlook run with all this third party code running in process? You know, yeah. I feel a little bit like a schmuck because I'm saying, hey, this should work. <laughs> but, you know, I understand the problems writing a really robust add in model, especially when the add ins are written in a couple different versions of .NET plus com plus, plus script. It's pretty, it's pretty hardcore stuff. But, yep. uh, I'm having no problem at all at uh, with my Outlook at home. I'm running Plaxo and three or four add ins and everything is working great. Cool. Now, OneNote and Outlook have got some pretty neat um, integration points, and you can read about that at uh, shrinkster.com slash foo, F-O-O. We finally got to the foo, Shrinkster. I, I noticed that, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. This is Chris Prattley's blog. This is a really cool guy. I actually was able to sit on a plane with this guy a couple of years back. This is the guy who actually kind of came up with the idea of OneNote. We need, to, we need a note-taking application, and Word's not it. Yeah. It's, you know, the end of to-do.txt. And this is also, interestingly, a guy who's very interested in language, and he was one of the fellows who uh, tried to get Ethiopian support into Word, uh, the next version of Word and Vista, along Mm. with uh, a couple other people like Michael Kaplan at Microsoft. So meeting this guy was amazing. I was just sitting on the... uh, uh, he actually lived in Japan, uh, and I was anyway. I was sitting on the plane with him, and I started talking about Microsoft. Oh, you work for Microsoft? Well, what do you do? Oh, I'm on the Word team, and I work on Office. Oh, really? What do you do now? I work. On, it's just one of these kind of things. Like, and I'm sitting next hmm. to you. This is the guy who can wow. get Ethiopian support into Word. I was just totally stoked. <laughs> He's got a great blog. It's primarily a OneNote blog now. He has an interesting post on OneNote and Outlook being best buddies. Cool. So uh, that's pretty cool, which is more than I can say for um, Adobe and Microsoft, who are not best buddies right now. Can you believe this nonsense? Yeah, what is up with that? Um, we talked about this on .NET Rocks yesterday, and uh, apparently Adobe has told Microsoft that they can't include the free and available Save as PDF API implementation in uh, in Word. For some reason, they want Microsoft to either charge for it, which to me doesn't make sense because it costs people money right and adobe doesn't get the money or they want to make it available as a a separate download if it's free so apparently the the result is that it's going to be available it's just going to be a second download so you'll everyone in the world will get get office and then they'll download this little thing yeah which doesn't make much sense because i can make pdfs now using pdf creator right uh for free pdf creator is available on sourceforge you install it, it makes a printer, and everyone can make PDFs. The difference is, and Adobe's beef is, that you know all those other little applications are, are one thing, but if it's in the most popular word processor in the world, why would anybody need to buy Adobe Acrobat? Well, and, and it begs the larger question, what's Adobe for again? Right, yeah. Right. What is the point of Adobe, like the company? To make money off of Acrobat. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Acrobat's still like 500 bucks or something right. unreal like that. But I don't understand. Who cares if Microsoft does it? You can go into OpenOffice at OpenOffice.org, yep. and they have Save as PDF, and no one's complained at them. And not only is the PDF support free, the whole uh, suite is free. Well, the Save as PDF API is under Adobe's licensing free for anybody to implement. Yeah, they've opened the whole format. Right. The whole PDF format's open, so I don't know what the problem is. You can see their paranoia because whether they're justified or not, they think that having that feature in Word is enough because there's millions and millions of Word users all over the world to uh, to persuade people not to buy Adobe Acrobat. But your point is, is good. You know, maybe it's time for Acrobat, the product, to, you know... No, for them to find other ways to make money off of uh, their publishing PDF stuff. Yeah, or just you know, I mean, give give up. They've opened they've opened up the. This is the thing. Word has a new XML format, right? Right. And you know, you save your files in the new version of Word, and you'll get a .docx extension. That's the yeah. new format. And by def- you know by default, if you don't have compatibility mode turned on, that's what you'll get. And uh, of course, you can always download add-ons. So if you're a 2003 user, you can go now and get the open uh, tools. So these are file conversion tools that would allow you as a 2003 or previous user to open up Word 2007 XML file format. So that's real nice for compatibility purposes. But mm-hmm. this is an open format. Now, it's a crazy, funky XML thing that is difficult to create. But if OpenOffice wants to support that, 
then I'm sure that they will. Right. Yeah, they may already. I don't know. Uh, Microsoft has to say, well, we make better Word documents. It's an open format, but our editor rocks. Right. And what I'm hearing is that Adobe's Acrobat Maker doesn't rock. No, it sucks, actually. And and so does their reader, quite frankly. And that's why Foxit Reader is the bomb. Yeah, ever since you turned me on to Foxit, I've removed Adobe uh, Acrobat from all of my machines. The reader. So if you have no Adobe product anywhere on your system for making or reading, again, what is Adobe for? Right. Very uncomfortable. There's an interesting blog post about it by Brian Jones of Microsoft at shrinkster.com slash FOS. Um, I think that, you know, I got to say, I think the Microsoft guys are at least the, the the personal people, the actual people that we talk to, the bloggers, the ones with personalities and faces and names, are handling it well because they really genuinely seem to want to provide value, right? I mean, I don't think that Joe, program manager on the Word team, is out to stick it to anybody. He just wants to make it awesome for for his users. Users want file save as PDF. That's, you know, how often do you want to do that? A couple times a week, you want to make a PDF. And all Adobe is doing is complaining and making it so, well, I have to go and download it and run. What the Acrobat really is is an add-on to Word to allow you to save as PDF. That's what Acrobat is, if you think about it, right? Yeah, absolutely. But now, Mike, but see, well, the thing I don't understand is Adobe just agreed to an, a settlement, which is Microsoft will, will pull the feature, but make it available via a free download. Well, that means that they have to go to the Adobe website and blah, blah, blah. No, have... they, they're going to put it on Microsoft.com. Really? Yeah, that's what doesn't make any sense. So, according to this website here at Brian Brian Jones' website, uh, who's one of the PMs, uh, you'll go to Microsoft.com, Microsoft Update or whatever, you'll download it separately. They just don't want it integrated. It makes sense to me. And the reason it makes sense is that I'm coming, fr I'm coming from the perception of Adobe being paranoid that just having it there available brainless as a standard feature – uh, is going to put Acrobat out of business. I see what you're saying. If it's already there, why even bother? Now, right. at least by separating it, there's a choice. So now they have a choice that they can buy Acrobat or they can download this feature, which doesn't, you know, d doesn't have the features of Acrobat. That's a very good point. Then they'll say, don't use this. Use our better one. Exactly. Pay a little bit of money, yada, yada, yada. You know, and, and the thing that's funny is that all of it might mean nothing when you have new things like the the idea about a web office coming out. Have you seen this? Yeah. Shrinkster.com slash FOV. You've got these folks like Ajax Wright and Ajax Sheet and these different sites that are saying, well, you don't really need office. All you want to do is fire up a an Ajaxified word and uh, right. do everything in the browser. Yeah. It may happen. Office Live, right? I don't know. I, I've never been a fan of this just because... There's so much stuff that you can put on the client that doesn't make sense on the web. You know, a spell check dictionary, for example. I mean, you could do that as a web service, I suppose. Well, there's lots of Ajaxified spell checkers that just uh, go back and forth to a, a server-side dictionary. Yeah. It's possible. You should take a look at AjaxWrite.com, bring it up in Firefox. You get a full version of um, Office 2005 in a browser. Wow. Now, it needs to be connected. But it's it's a real thing. I mean, you, you, believe me, take a look at AjaxWrite.com. It'll blow your mind in Firefox. Only okay. works in Firefox, though. And it's really not Ajax. It's what they call Zool, X-U-L, hmm. which is a Firefox specific. It's a basically Firefox click once. But uh, this is that guy who runs uh, what form formerly Lindos, Linspire, Michael Robertson. All right, right. He's the kind of the rich madman behind all of that. And uh, he's off paying Ajax developers to create applications to... Uh, to show Google up and to show, you know, uh, Microsoft up. But, you know, even if you don't believe that Michael Robertson is, uh, is nuts or not, Google one day will come out with, you know, they, but they, they just bought Rightly, which is, mm. an, it was an online word. Hmm. Uh, they may just come out with something. Star office over the web. You never know. Yeah. There's also the privacy issue that, uh, you know, whatever you're typing is going back and forth across the web, uh, could be the potential is there. And um, maybe you don't, you know, maybe you want the privacy of being on your own machine. You know, and I agree that that may be enough for you and I to be concerned about, but I don't think my son's going to care in 10 years when there's some entirely connected thing. He, he won't be thinking about things like that because by then we'll have info card. We'll all have our own personal certificates implanted behind our ears and we'll sit down and the RFID will talk to the PC and then it'll all just be <laughs> thought from there. Yeah. So, uh, Scott, let me end this week's show with a, a story that's kind of funny. Uh, I've talked about my mom on .NET Rocks a few times. She's sort of, uh, um, she's addicted to the Internet, but she's complete neophyte when it comes to learning anything about 
windows. You know, she, I could look right at her and I've done this. I looked right at her and I said, mom, do you have a DVD, uh, drive? And she'll look at me and say, I, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean by that? You know, do you have a DVD drive? That thing that where you press the button and the tray comes out. I have to say that. And then you put the things in there. Yeah. So anyway, so my mother calls me up the other day and I'm a, it's like 45 minutes before I have to go to a function. I have to be somewhere. And she calls me up complaining uh, about my brother who uh, went up to her house to fix her computer or something. And she's saying, oh, I told him not to empty the recycle bin and he did it anyway. He's so disrespectful. I gave him a what for. And I said, well, mom, you're you're supposed to empty the recycle bin from time to time. But I told him not to because I had stuff in there. Well, what do you mean? Well, and then I find out that she's recording off the radio. She records off the radio into a cool edit or something. And uh, she had a program coming up she needed to record, and her hard disk was full. So she didn't know what to do. So my brother goes up. First thing he sees is all this stuff in the recycle bin. What does he do? Gets rid of it. And she says, no, don't get rid of that recycle. Don't empty that recycle bin. He goes, well, Mom, this is this is how you get your space back. Watch. Shwoop, there it goes. And then she threw a fit. So what <laughs> what happens was she was moving stuff into the recycle bin thinking it was going to give her more space on her disk. So I had to explain that to her. And, you know, of course, my brother's an engineer. And the last thing he's thinking of is that she's actually doing that, right? So I, I I told her I had to go somewhere, but I'd buy a hard drive and bring it over in the morning. So I did. I went to Staples, and I got a 300-gig Mac Store hard drive off the shelf. And the next morning, I go over there, and I pull it out. And I'm looking at it, and it looks kind of funny. And, and I can't really figure out what's funny about it. The label on the top is a little fuzzy. And then I noticed that there's some stickum on a couple of the sides, you know, like as if a label had been there and then been pulled off. And I noticed lots of fingerprints. And then I see some wear on the uh, on the on the cable connectors and uh, a little dust. And I noticed that there's no jumper shunt, you know, for the master slave stuff. So I'm thinking this is this is used and it was in the box. So. I plug it in, pull it up. It's a 20 gig drive. I thought I was buying a 300 gig drive. It's a used 20 gig drive. This happens all the time. You heard about? You haven't heard about this? I haven't heard about this. So people uh, people buy the drives. This is what I'm assuming is that somebody bought the drive, swapped theirs, said brought it back, said it doesn't work. You know, they slapped a label over the old label. Sure enough, I, I peeled it back, and the original label for this drive was underneath. Yep. There's actually some controversy about this. It's not clear whether this is I mean it's probably happening locally. Yeah. But there's some talk that it may also have happened at the factory. Yeah, I mean that that would be more sinister. Oh yeah, but at any point in the chain, right? Somebody looks at it and says, "Oh, that's a fine-looking drive. I want to get I want to get me some of that." Right. And I'll just swap it with this old one. And and you know that when you, all you got to do is go to Best Buy or or one of these little places when they're just a little too busy. Just a little too busy to pay attention. Right. It's very sad. All they got to do is open it up, look, and say, yep, that's a 300 gig drive, all right. You know? What was on the drive? Uh, no, you know, there was nothing on the drive. And the first thing I did was I, I looked at it with like an undelete program to see if it found any files, and it didn't. Um, and if I have time, I'm going to uh, look at it with something like um, on track. Yeah, spin right, something like that. Yeah, something like that. So. Recovery software. You might find a couple copies of, like, you know, stackered versions of DOS 4. Well, I'm hopefully what I'm going to find is some personal information about the guy. And then I can uh, bring that back to Staples and say, look up in your records and see, you know, that you uh, you sold a 300 gig drive to this guy. And I bet you'll find it in his computer. That's evil. That's what I want to do. But I'll let you know how it turns out next week. All right. In the meantime... Uh, have a good week, and we'll talk to you next week on Hanson Lights. <laughs> <laughs>